Okay, so um, everybody's hungry, but I hope you're hungry for this topic because, in fact, um, it's rare to have an opportunity to um, think about in a very tangible way what it's going to mean um, to access and use um, information across disciplinary boundaries. And this is an area of interest of mine. It has been for a couple of decades now. So it's a fabulous um, way to bring together some of the work I've been doing. For those of you, you'll notice on this slide, if you haven't caught wind yet, um, I am going to be leaving the University of Illinois and starting a new position at the University of Washington at the Information School on September 1st. So you can look for me there. So what I want to cover um, are basically just some reflections and high points and highlights that I think are really salient considering um, the task in front of NDS and other kinds of federation projects and initiatives. So the idea of cyber infrastructure is very important to return to, I think, at this point, and how much it's really about phases of development and relationships what it really means to develop and um, propagate usable data resources and for scientists and researchers to really understand what that is. Um, and then um, thinking about cross-disciplinary access and reuse and what that means in terms of impact and value as opposed to um, maybe just quantity and uh, size and search. So a new opportunity to get serious about cross-disciplinary cyber infrastructure. We hear about it all the time. We've heard about it for decades. Um, Ed will be surprised that I pulled this little statement out of an email that he circulated to a task force at the University of Illinois. Um, but in fact, I get a little cranky and I usually say, oh, there's no interdisciplinarity without disciplinarity. But Ed has a nice way of putting it in his outline in this email that disciplinary strengths are needed for multidisciplinary research. And um, that's really sort of behind what it is I want to talk about today. But I also have a chapter in this um, um, handbook, uh, Oxford Handbook of Interdisciplinarity, where I make this <clears throat> sort of closing statement after talking about how information systems are developing and becoming networked um, and what that means for interdisciplinary access. And I say the greatest challenges for information systems is not the ability to move across disciplinary boundaries, but in maintaining the increasingly long and mutable intellectual paths to our disciplinary past. And it's not that the boundaries aren't hard. It's that how much you can lose as you're going across those boundaries. And interestingly enough, while I was sitting here this morning, I got an email from the editor who's asking for the revision of this chapter for the next edition. And so I'm hoping <clears throat> that this project can inform how I can go about you know, really talking about this next chapter. OK, so here's my perspective. I've been studying, um, I, I take the scientist or researcher perspective. We study what scientists really um, need in order to feel like it's reasonable for them to let go of their data and share it, what it means for someone else to use their data. We studied primarily long tail in a number of projects, about 16 different um, disciplines. And that's sort of the perspective I bring um, but like I said, I want to return to what infrastructure and cyber infrastructure really means. And um, for many of us, you know, this has become the, the classic report, the 2007 NSF report on understanding infrastructure. And if you go back now and read it, all of it is still true. All of it, um, we think, I, I tell my students, you should be returning to this report almost every day because it's full of so many things that we need to be thinking about to really make things work and to make a difference. But one of the basic tenets, of course, is that <clears throat> infrastructure grows. It grows first by individual systems that become networked, and then those networks become internetworked. It's exactly what we've been, been talking about today, right? So what happens? We have homogeneous, centralized, local things happening, um, and then they become heterogeneous, distributed, coordinated things. Um, and this happens through a process of technology growth and transfer, consolidation, where things come together in networks, um, and then gateways for interoperation. <clears throat> I had a great introduction to this at NCAR last week. I was here um, with my third group of students who have come for the third summer now um, to, to take inter internships here to start learning about premier data management from the premier mentors, or NCAR. And even NCAR is thinking about coordination at the local level. And again, it's that idea of consolidation 
of the systems, even within an institution, um, and then the gateways for interoperation. Now, of course, RDA has been talking about this from the beginning. Um, it's really the philosophy behind what they've been doing. So they're explicitly addressing um, the technical social dynamic, the local global dynamic. They're very de devoted to ground up design. And they have this great you know, statement that I think is very true, a paper that Mark um, and Fran did for the ACES Bulletin last year, where they say, this is the make or break phrase. phase. It's happening now. Um, and that if we don't pay attention to all these things, we'll be the break and not the make. I think that's what you were implying. Um, and so I think all of us feel in this room we have this great opportunity now. It is the make phase. Everything's sort of in place. Um, and we can go on to make those relationships. The other important thing in this um, report is the idea that your early choices constrain your options. So while all of you made choices in your systems, we're making choices again when we're putting them back together again. OK, so understanding infrastructure has this concept of reverse salience. It's a military term concept. It's the idea that the the front, you know, the troops are marching forward and there's um, something that's holding it back. There's something that's not allowing um, the whole effort to go forward. And the things that are identified that seem to be the most common reverse salience or the weakest links um, in this growing network of systems are things like middleware specifications, diverse data formats, um, and collecting and standardizing metadata. We've heard about these things today. We hear about it at all the meetings like this. But there's lots of them. We've heard about others. They've heard about them today. Scaling, preservation, incentives, human infrastructure, sustainability. These are all things we heard today. I didn't know they were all going to come up, but they did. But the other one that they call out in understanding infrastructure is disciplinary cultures. And many people have mentioned it or alluded to it today. But in fact, from the work I do, I don't see the cultures as a reverse salient. I don't see it as a weak link. I see it as the way work is done in research. Um, and it's the kinds of things that often matter the most um, are in these cultures. And these are also things we can't lose along the way as we're federating and funneling and bringing things together. So often what we have to do is what do we accommodate, what do we leverage that's powerful from those cultures. And I think that's a really interesting thing to think about. So there are dimensions to me, not uh, problems or reverse salience or weakest links. And one of the dimensions that's not really a discipline, but we don't hear much about, um, is the paradigm dimension. We hear about the fourth paradigm all the time. But what we don't hear about, and I, I wish we would talk more about, are the four paradigms. The, all four of them all together um, because, and this is a quote um, from John Wilbanks in the fourth paradigm, in his chapter of the fourth paradigm, but is often not talked about. Data intensive science is not sweeping away the old reality for a paradigm in the Kuhnian sense, for you know, a real, uh, change in reality. It's really a continuum. We've got modern scientific method that includes and extends all the previous methods. And we can't lose those along the way. We're building on those. And so empiricism and theory and computation and data intensive science all work together. And what's really interesting is when you think about the dependencies among those in terms of data and in terms of cyber infrastructure. Um, Margaret mentioned the one National Academies um, study committee that we're on together now. I was on another one that was cyber infrastructure for combustion research. And the day that the, the report and the way of thinking about cyber infrastructure really started to come together was the day we sat down seriously and just mapped out all the relationships and dependencies among the sub-disciplines in the different engineering and chemistry um, and all the different specializations within those fields, who needed what data for what reason, at what time, with what tools, in what ways, and how to optimize that. And once we mapped that out, talking about the cyber infrastructure became very um, rational and easy and exciting. And it, it really fell together after that. So lots of other dimensions. And I won't spend much time on these. I've given other talks, and some of you have been at them. Um, I had a, gave a talk at RDA um, last year about evidentiary cultures, which I think are very important. There's a great case by um, Harry Collins on gravitational wave research, the differences um, from how it evolved in the Italian labs versus the US labs. 
as um, the idea of what really qualifies as a publishable output of research um, and how you know it really is a matter of who takes responsibility for the validity and the meaning of those outputs. And I think this is so true in every community that we've studied as well. So with this particular case, um, with the um, US teams, the lab was taking responsibility. They wanted a lot of interpretation to go in before they would let go of a result, whereas the Italian community is fe felt it was much more a community responsibility, and therefore they were willing to release something that was much more raw. It's something that they called a coincidence. We saw a coincidence, which is mu much more raw data-like, as opposed to we saw a wave. You know, where there is a long interpretation, string of interpretation that goes behind that. So in some fields, maybe it's going to be a long time before we get to that sort of community-based, I can let go of it early. Um, but that's OK, because that's the way these, um, these communities contribute to their science. Um, in the work that we've been doing recently, the dimension that's been um, extremely important for thinking about federating data is the site-based dimension. These are um, geologists, biologists, biochemists, um, geochemists who work out in particular scientifically significant sites. Therefore, that's what matters in terms of bringing the data together for federation. Um, so it's very multidisciplinary, and we get a lot of variation. Yes, spatial temporal is the you know, factor by which they want things organized and be able to access and understand it. But in certain disciplines, it's not just spatial temporal. It's we want three coordinates in three different ways. We want the altitude on top of that, and it has to be measured at the vent, or else we can't use it. There will be no reuse. And also, I haven't been able to track down the evidence for sure yet, but claims that um, disease researchers in other fields have made the same statements, that we can't use your microbial research unless we know exactly the measurement from the vent at the time. And it's because of the environments where this data is coming from is so dynamic. It's changing all the time. These are hot springs. There's travertine growings by the minute. And if you don't know the way it was that day, that hour, um, you can't use the, the data or compare it with anything else. The other dimension that um, we've been really focused on is the producer-consumer dimension, because getting people to let go of their data is really convincing the producer that it's, um, again, it's valid and it's going to have meaning. It's the same idea as the evidentiary culture. Um, and so what that means in terms of how complex the data sets are, how you package them, we've been working with the Data Conservancy on packaging um, complex sets. At the same time, we can see that, especially with uh, water and geochemistry data, that certain usable parts are things that can be done very quickly and moved out very quickly and also aggregated in meaningful ways. So understanding that dynamic, again, what's releasable from the producer's perspective, but what's reusable from the consumer's perspective are sometimes two different sets of requirements. Um, and the versioning we've already heard about several times today, but um, very important and very interesting and has everything to do with reuse and especially meaning for reuse. So many of you are probably familiar with you know, the NASA data levels. Um, I understand now there's a new paper coming out of NSIDC with Ruth and uh, Dewar and one of my students where they've extended these levels to think about the further curation that happens down the way. But really, um, we know quite a bit about these levels in terms of which ones can get used by which communities. Some get little use by very particular communities. Some get wide use, but again, by certain people who know the instrumentation. And other variables, um, as you go down, I'm sorry, other variations um, can get quite wide use from secondary users. So again, thinking about federating and making things available across fields, you, you know, in this case, you'd be moving down the wide use across fields would have to be at this um, 1B level, depending on which version of the NASA levels you see. Um, OK, so other things, you know, I've been studying um, cross-disciplinary and interdisciplinary information use in a lot of places in a lot of ways. And even before, well, when we just started studying data, um, back in neuroscience labs, we were also tracking um, a literature-based discovery system that was being field tested in four different labs across the country. And what we were looking for is what kinds of information have the highest impact on moving research forward. Um, and 
and it was in this idea of, you know, as a, these literature-based discovery systems were sort of like um, the ideas that Phil Bourne was talking about of really trying to understand how something can be used far afield. And that's the thing we were really looking for. So these case studies in neuroscience, we followed these uh, groups for over a uh, year and a half, two years, and really um, didn't trust them when they said, oh, this had the greatest impact. We waited six months. We went back. We said, ah, oh, now tell me what, what really moved your research forward. Now that you've you know, seen this happen or you know, you've, you've actually assessed the results relative to other results. So some of the things we found I think are quite um, important and pertinent when we think about trying to really facilitate that in a very large national scale system. So the greatest impact was from looking for information that was rather far afield, you know, pretty foreign, but very specific. So I need this protocol. I need to know the calibration of this instrument, how it was done. Very sp particular things had the greatest impact, but also quite uncommon, very low frequency. But we go back after a year and people say, oh yeah, I could not have moved forward. We would have never made that discovery had we not found that. On the other hand, something that happens much more frequently, but has much more moderate impact was the ability to really explore rather freely um, in disciplines in more conceptual ways, to really get your grounding and understand how your, how your research is relating to that in another field. So little trade off there, you still need to really be able to explore moderate impact more frequent. The interesting thing for us, though, was that in every case, and we had six or seven other categories of kinds of um, information seeking that was going on, but the most interesting thing is that in every case, you, these researchers know enough about validity and meaning from information far afield that they couldn't just run off and apply it. There's a whole series of processes that come after that to actually be able to apply that information to your field knowing it's coming from somewhere else. So if we really have, are going to have national comprehensive systems, they have to support that background work that comes after the little discovery or the big conceptual discovery. Um, the other thing that I think is really important, big national growing systems, they're scaling, they're getting large, you're losing control, nobody knows what's in them, right? We, especially if you're harvesting and, and getting data um, in streams constantly or harvesting. So being able to wrap for users, for researchers who are really doing exploring or looking for these specific things, be able to do this very rapid review and assessment. And this is what um, Alan Rainier and I called in our science paper. We were really talking about the literature here, but we called strategic reading. But I think it's going to be very true in these large systems, uh, federated systems especially, is how do we do strategic reading of data? How do we know what's there quickly enough to make a quick decision on what to pursue? to get that specific thing or to do that exploration or know that's the right track to go down. Um, and we're seeing this in the geobiology groups that we're in. They've been able to um, really figure out that an image and a date um, of a place, a hot spring, they can see what season it is, they can see what the conditions are, they know those places well enough that that's enough to get them started. They can have a, a long array of those in front of them and um, that's enough to get them moving to strategically read through what the data options are for them. And we're working with SEED um, to sort of think about how to apply their system to, to help them do that. So um, I'm not going to say too much more about, um, there's lots to say about cross-disciplinary value and the complications of these growing systems. We've done a lot of work with Europeana um, and also in our own national cultural heritage aggregations where we've seen you know, small, unique, valuable, most valuable from the researcher's perspective, um, data being lost in retrieval sense, right? When you're trying to retrieve from getting lost in the flood of large collections. So really trying to work our systems to balance that off so you can see um, what's out there. And then representing the whole in a way. And again, we, we talk about search is so important, and it is. And I was glad to see people talking about browsing. But creative browsing, this quick reading, you know, strategic reading is going to be really important. We're also learning a lot about value indicators, what's really important um, for researchers, how we know what value might be the most important. Um, and um, none of those ideas will probably surprise you, but it will help us prioritize. Okay, so just a last few comments. Implications for national data service. 
Um, requirements for reusable high valuable data are tightly tied to the paradigms and the disciplines, the strengths, the roots, the dependencies. And I think this is a particular challenge for institutional repositories. Um, they're not, you know, the disciplines are building these cues, they're building the context into what they're doing in ways that are very responsive to their communities. Um, institutional repositories, it's harder. At the same time, disciplinary aren't necessarily thinking about those people coming as far, you know, far afield. Um, invest in disciplinary dimensions, value and functionality. And then really, I hope we can come up with ways of thinking about metrics of success that are beyond the numbers. Um, again, like I said, the most high impact were the lowest frequency. So how do we make sure we're capturing that and able to show um, the value of, of working across disciplines, even though it might, the, the big discovery might be fairly uncommon. Okay, so there's my teams and the people who have helped me with this work, and thank you for listening before lunch. And if you would, thank all our speakers. Thank you, Carol.